This week on the Backtable Podcast. You know, part of the problem is a lot of the studies that have been done have looked at sort of funny endpoints, like did it change what the doctor did or did it make the patient feel better? Those are fine endpoints, don't get me wrong, but they're very, very soft endpoints, right? Doctors, you know, what you and I do may be different and, and that's not a good or a bad thing. It's just a thing, right? So the key is looking at it in a sort of protocol, standardized manner and getting meaningful outcomes. So as the data evolves, I think we'll know more. And particularly as we get more treatments, because, you know, there may be a role for something like a checkpoint inhibitor way downstream in the selected correct patient with the right mutation and the right risk. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Backtable podcast your source for all things urology. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and at backtable.com. This is Aditya Bagrodia as your host this week, and I'm very excited to introduce our guest today, David Penson from Vanderbilt University, Department of Urology, where he is the chair and full professor. Welcome to the show, Dave. How are you doing today? I'm all right, Aditya. It's good to see you and hear you. Yeah, good to see you too. I've had the good fortune of getting to know Dave outside of training under him in a couple of different occasions as he's visited two institutions as a, as a VP and just love the insight, the way you approach things and, and looking forward to picking your brain on the kind of role of surgery for high risk prostate cancer. So let's just jump right into it, Dave. You know, basic definitions, high risk prostate cancer. What are you kind of thinking here? Aditya, that's a really good place to start because I think that there's a lot of heterogeneity in that. You know, if you go back to the old D'Amico criteria, we were talking about anyone who had a PSA above 20, a Gleason score greater than 10, or anyone who was T2C or higher. But we've now got the NCCN talking about high risk versus very high risk disease. AUA and EAU are going in different directions. To me, I think if you go back to the original D'Amico criteria, if you have a Gleason sum greater than or equal to eight, right away, that makes you high risk in my book. If you're T3, you're definitely high risk. They talk about T2C. I'm not too sure how often we see that in the rectal exam. But I think in the end, if you use the D'Amico criteria, you're probably in good shape. We can discuss sort of what happens with the four plus threes and the person has a PSA of 15, because a lot of times they don't seem like high risk when you walk in the door, but they turn out to be high risk when you treat them. Probably the safest thing to do is to use the D'Amico criteria. And and what really drives it, as I think you know, is Gleason score. I mean, the pathologic differentiation to me is probably the strongest prognostic variable when you're talking about high risk patients. Yeah, I, I can't say that I find any meaningful difference between high risk and very high risk. I mean, fortunately, T4 tumors are kind of the rule, not the except or the exception, not the rule. With clinical staging, how do you incorporate MRIs? Does that kind of substitute clinical staging? I mean, I don't think my finger can get up to the SV in the bulk of the cases. The reality of it is I've started getting MRIs on the majority, not all, but the vast majority of patients who I operate on because I do find it really helpful for surgical planning. It really isn't giving you a lot of information, as you said, you know, about T3B disease. You see it, but you usually know it's going to be a bad actor beforehand. To me, the MRI is really helpful for distinguishing between sort of the T2 patient and the T3A patient and also looking at the bladder neck, you know, is there a median lobe? I do think you're right. It's sort of replacing DRE, but because not every patient gets it, and as much as you'd like to get on every patient in the U.S., payers aren't going to pay for it in every patient, unfortunately. So to me, I think you're right. It's starting to replace DRE, but it hasn't completely. I still think there's a role for DRE, even though, as you know, it's pretty darn rare that you, you know, feel something on rectal. And when you do, that's clearly a high-risk patient because that's usually a bad actor. So tertiary referral center, quaternary referral center in Vanderbilt, folks coming in to see you, brand new diagnosis. They've got a PSA of 10, 12, grade group four, grade group five. Are you starting the conversation about definitive management at this point? Or do you really like to get your staging and make sure you're not dealing with somebody who's got metastases, oligometastases? I'm definitely starting my discussion at that point, because I think it takes all time to get patients to recognize that the patient you described with a high PSA above 10 or so, and more importantly, with a, you know, a a grade group four, grade group five lesion, they're very likely to need multimodal therapy. And they're very likely in the long run to be at increased risk for metastatic disease. So I'd rather start the discussion by saying, look, 
We're going to work you up and make sure the cancer hasn't spread already. But I want to start the patient thinking, okay, surgery alone, radiation alone, it's not going to do the trick if it's localized. It's likely if I'm having radiation, I'm going to need hormone therapy. If I'm having surgery, there's a good possibility I'm going to need an adjuvant treatment afterwards. Patients need a little time to get their arms around it, you know? Yeah, I think you're spot on. I mean, with that first conversation, it's deer in the headlights. You have no idea what's being synthesized and absorbed. One of the, I've kind of struggled with it, with 21st century availability of information. I hate to kind of share something on Epic. Hey, you know, my chart message, you've got cancer. I'll usually call and at least give them the cliff notes and say, I'm going to send you some resources, do your homework. So when you come in to chat with me, we can have a little bit more of a productive discussion. And, you know, I don't have any vested interest, but I've really enjoyed David Keynes as well-prepped apt as a NCCN guidelines. Here's prostatectomy, here's radiation. And, you know, by all means, this podcast is going to go on there as well. Let me just add one thing that I think is important that you're really getting at. Patients are going to go on the web as well. You're going to tell them they have prostate cancer, and they're going to see a lot about active surveillance. They're going to see a lot about the old axiom, more men die with prostate cancer than of it. And I think it's, it's really important when they walk in the door to let them know what their risks are and let them know if they have high-risk disease that this is something that requires treatment, assuming they're healthy and relatively young enough. This is not something that we're just going to sort of poo-poo, which I think a lot of patients in 2022 are starting to think, Okay, well, you know, active surveillance is great. I don't have to treat my prostate cancer. And, and it's true, obviously, in a low-risk disease, but I think you got to lay that out there. Yeah, and I'm a fan of well prep too. I, I think David Keynes has done an incredible thing with that. And I have no interest in it either, so we're clear. So staging, we're kind of in a bit of a renaissance, and I think it's going to totally shift the way that the next set of trials, the way we think about oligometastases. But high-risk patient, A, what are the tests that you're getting? And B, in a high-risk patient, does the Gleason score versus the rectal exam versus the PSA actually impact which staging tests you're getting? Yeah. Let's address the elephant in the room, which is the novel imaging and PSMA PET scans. As we get more comfortable with the imaging and as more importantly, as payers become more open to paying for it, we're going to see more and more use of PSMA scanning in these high-risk patients. I think it's going to play a very important role in the future. We don't know how it's going to influence things. All of our data are based on bone scans and to some degree MRIs and CTs. PSMA is a, is a game changer, right? I'd be guessing if I said, well, you know, if someone has a PSMA positive, they have nodes, they had metastatic disease, so we shouldn't treat them anymore. We should. It's a different animal entirely. That being said, right now, it's really hard to get a PSMA scan approved in the sort of pretreatment setting, certainly in patients with commercial insurance in the U.S. So in the high-risk patients, I'm still getting a bone scan because it's sort of standard of care. It's an inexact, it's an inexpensive test may also be an inexact test. And I am getting a prostate MRI. It's very important for surgical planning. Patients are, you know, interested in knowing, can you spare a nerve or not? And I think it helps you there. I also think it lets you know what's going on at the bladder neck. Patient maybe have a, has a median lobe. Maybe there's concern about bladder neck involvement. So that's, that's my workup at this point. If a patient's going to radiation, they're probably going to get a, a simulation CT as well. Okay. Yeah. We've actually had pretty good luck out here on the West Coast getting uh, staging PSMA PET scans. I mean, it's entered the NCCN guidelines and shockingly, one of the things our insurance companies here are, are okay with. And I, I totally agree, except for the fact if they've got like bulky disease on an MRI, I haven't gotten a CT scan of the abdomen and pelvis and the chest in five to seven years. But I will say that, you know, for me, I'm actually getting a PSMA PET scan, a bone scan, and MRI of the prostate. You know, just kind of like the trials indicate, there are scenarios popping up with, you know, one or two nodes in the pelvis. Let's say it's on a PSMA PET scan or an MRI, a node or two in the pelvis. Does that take surgery off the table? Does that kind of change your counseling? I don't think it takes surgery off the table, but I may be biased. I think surgeons uh, want to operate and radiation oncologists want to radiate. And the reality of it is, is that in these patients, they're probably going to see both at some point. You know, I see a patient with a positive note on MR, for example. It doesn't change things because, you know, you're going to get false positives on MR. And there may be some value to a local therapy. If you look at, you know, Brian Chapin's ongoing study and you look at Stampede with radiotherapy, even in oligometastatic disease, there's value to local treatment, right? So there's probably value to local treatment in patients who have positive pelvic cleft nodes. 
the question is, does it change the discussion of surgery versus radiation? And I don't know the answer to that. Thing about radiation is that if you're going to treat with primary radiation, either way, they're going to, you know, probably irradiate the pelvic nose to some degree. Whereas with surgery, we're going to do a lymph node dissection, but we're not going to take all the nodes out. And I don't personally believe the lymph node dissection is therapeutic. I think it's diagnostic. I've had numerous arguments with different people about it. Just biologically, it doesn't make any sense to me. And so by the same token, probably pelvic radiotherapy uh, doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but the trials seem to indicate that maybe it does. So I may be wrong. Yeah, I share basically all of those sentiments. I think I'm a little influenced by my main passion, which is testicular cancer, where predictable patterns of metastases, we can still cure with regional lymph node metastases. I will say that it's not a absolute contraindication, but if it's a perirectal node, my enthusiasm for surgery goes way, way down. Oh yeah, that's a different animal. You know, most of the nodes we see are in the obturator region. A perirectal node is a different animal entirely. I agree with you. I think that's a patient who's probably better served with radiation and has to accept the fact. I think in all these patients, they sort of have to accept the fact that there's a good possibility they're going to need systemic therapy. This is where I go back to the sort of old Halstead versus Fisher argument, and I'm firmly in the Fisher camp. I think biologically, if a cancer has the ability to spread into the lymph nodes, it's got the ability to spread anywhere it darn well pleases. And so we probably need to treat the entire body and not just the pelvis. Yeah. And you, and you mentioned SWOG 1802, great trial. You know, I, I somehow struggle a little bit, especially in the low volume meds where we've got level one data for radiation. The other kind of area that I sometimes have a hard time with are younger patients, a couple of nodes, maybe like a bony met in the pelvis that are like, doc, I want to be aggressive. I want it out. And then I want to get radiation afterwards. I want you to SBRT the nodes. I want Abby. I want ADT. How do you kind of approach that, Dave? I put myself in the patient's sort of seat. There is not a lot of evidence for doing that at you, right? You know, and I've seen people, quote unquote, throw the kitchen sink at it. You know, Mike Zalewski up in New York, who's a radiation oncologist who you know well, He's using every single hormonal therapy known to mankind when he radiates those patients. We're developing evidence there, but I kind of look at those patients and they're desperate, right? And they're terrified. You know, they're in their early 50s and they have aggressive cancer. And, and if I was sitting where they were, accepting the fact that the evidence isn't there, I'm not opposed to it. And that's an argument in my mind for surgery up front because surgery is probably going to be followed by radiation, which is probably going to be followed by systemic therapy. And I think those patients, rightfully are, are grasping at straws, but I will acknowledge up front, I think it's important to acknowledge up front, we don't have good level one evidence. In fact, we don't have that much observational evidence below it to support what we're doing. It just sort of makes us feel better, I think, to some degree. It's tough. We have our biases. As I continue to age, it's not like if you were my dad, now it's solid like if you were my brother or if you were me, this is what I would do. And it, it does kind of change the approach. So, you know, in addition to staging, are you getting any additional, te I'm, get, I'm assuming getting germline testing, concording with the NCC and guideline, you've done a lot of great work in that area. Any tumor profiling, you know, whether that's NGS or decipher oncotype, Polaris, whatever? Yeah, I, the short answer is no. It's really not going to change my management in these patients. You know, I don't want to get a test unless it's going to move me one way or another, right? I think the germline testing is important for two reasons. Number one, these patients are going to be at risk for recurrences and metastases down the road, so it might drive uh, immuno-oncology treatment, number one. But number two, they can alert their family members if it turns out they have a mutation, because a lot of them do. But genomic testing and these other markers, I mean, maybe it's valuable for informing patients about prognosis, but it's not changing my treatment. At least that's my experience with it. Yeah, I think in the high risk, we're not kind of there yet. I think there's some trials you know, that are being done and some data from previous trials that are being analyzed that may show a role. And we've actually got a trial here of neoadjuvant PARP inhibitors in high-risk patients. So if they've got a BRCA mutation, either germline or somatic, you know, that would be, that's the next wave. But I would say that's, that's pretty niche as it stands. How about, is there any role for neoadjuvant treatment in your, in your armamentarium? I knew you were going to go there just from the start of it, which I'm old enough to been through the last cycle of neoadjuvant. And so it definitely biases me. And you're aware of studies from the 90s when, when I was a resident where patients were given GenRH agonists preoperatively. And we all got real excited because the positive margin rate plummeted and we thought we were doing these patients a favor. And five years later, the recurrence rates were the same. So it was a pathologic artifact. 
The argument now is, okay, well, we have these new agents. As you know, you were just talking about it. Whether it's novel hormonal agents, whether it's, you know, PARP inhibitors, and maybe they'll change things in the neoadjuvant setting. And my feeling is, biologically, I could see it, but we have to study it. So we'll do it, but I only want to do it on trial at this point. It's not standard of care yet. My gut feeling, honestly, I tell you, because I was there last time, is that it's going to turn out to be, you know, it's not going to make a difference. But I would be more than happy to be wrong about that. And I probably will be wrong about that because I'm a natural skeptic. And, and these drugs are really something different and new, particularly the, the PARP inhibitors. Yeah, so we have Proteus open, which is a trial of neoadjuvant apalutamide, and it's six months induction. And I've got to say, I've had a real hard time enrolling patients. They're just not into it. Many of the times, especially if they're considering surgery, one of the big appealing draws is getting to avoid any type of hormonal manipulator. That's kind of been my personal experience, and it could just be my, my counseling. I actually thought that the most recent Alliance CalGB trial of docetaxel the data wasn't bad, but that's just, a, I feel like it's a tough sell, you know, sign yourself up for multiple cycles of, you know, true chemotherapy, you know, in an ultra motivated patient, I think it's, I guess, worth a conversation. The trials of looking at a dose tax on the adjuvant setting, as you know, were disappointing. I guess in the neoadjuvant setting for downsizing, maybe, but I'm with you. It's a hard sell for patients. You know, I'm not sure if the benefit is worth this sort of risk. They don't want to have chemotherapy if they can avoid it. It goes back to what I was saying before. Patients have this sort of preconceived notion about prostate cancer that, oh, it's not that bad. And that's true in a lot of cases. But I think in a lot of cases, you know, Casey mentioned before, the young fellow with really a bad tumor, you want to be aggressive. Absolutely. So so we've got our, we've got our staging. We're not getting any additional tests. We're confirmed localized high-risk prostate cancer patient intake, what are the kind of critical elements here that are really going to be mandatory for helping guide that decision? I think there are a bunch of different pieces to it. And I think this is where we get into the standard surgery versus radiation discussion. The prostate MRI, as I said before, is really helpful. A lot of these patients are thinking, okay, well, do I have any chance of having sexual function once I get treated for prostate cancer in either arm? And the answer is well, maybe, not as much as we like to think, right? So the first discussion that I always have with the patient is, I'll, this is sort of standard and this seems like, you know, mom and apple pie, but I see more and more it doesn't get sort of included, which is let's talk about where your sexual function is now. Let's talk about where your urinary function is now. And let's discuss what's important to you there. Because in the end, the argument against surgery really comes down to the side effect profile in my mind, specifically around urinary function and leakage. Some men are just not willing to go down that road. The argument against radiation is you can't get surgery later, so you're taking one of your treatments off the table. We know that adjuvant radiotherapy can be helpful in patients who need it. So that's kind of where the discussion in my mind boils down to is the side effect profile versus the ability to have two treatments as opposed to one. The other point that I think is a little bit of me getting on a soapbox, but I'm okay with that sometimes. We as surgeons, when we talk about surgery, get very excited about doing nurse bearing. You know, it's sort of like a little bit of a badge of honor. I think a lot of times in these high-risk patients, it's of limited value. And we may be hurting the patient because I don't want to do a nurse bearing operation that's cancer sparing. It's really important to A, know the patient's sexual function at baseline. Because if they're impotent to baseline or have really poor sexual function, what are you doing sparing a nerve? Probably not going to help the patient. The other point is with the MRI, if you see your extracapsular extension on the right side, for example, whatever side it is, sparing a nerve and running the risk of positive margins is not what you want. And so I think that's another key point. But when I start counseling patients, you know, it really is a matter of side effects versus the ability to have a second therapy. Those are excellent points. And you've also done a lot of pioneering work, kind of comparative patient-reported outcomes. And I think one of the things that we kind of gloss over on the urology side is actually impact on bowel function. Can you talk a little bit about that and, and maybe just a bit about what your kind of preferred standardized PRO intake is? Yeah, two separate questions. All of our patients fill out the EPIC questionnaire. Uh, we've incorporated into our clinical practice. Dan Barocas has sort of been the, the leader in that of Vanderbilt, and we have a lot of data on our patients, and it's really useful on a lot of levels. I would encourage folks 
particularly if you're in a large group, whether it's academic or community practice, to incorporate that into their routine prostate cancer care. Because you can actually do quality control, see which patients are doing well, and you do get some insight. The comment about bowel function is really interesting because as surgeons, we've always been very much sort of, and don't forget, radiation's tough on your bowel function. And yet now when we look at our recent data from our CSER study, which is a much more modern cohort than the stuff we've done previously, these are big cohorts, you know, population-based studies. The changes that have been made in radiation therapy have minimized bowel dysfunction. I'm not saying it doesn't happen because it does, but it's not what it was 20 years ago. The last piece is the space or the hydrogel that people are putting between the prostate and the rectum that's minimizing the impact on bowel dysfunction. So I think it's something you have to discuss, Aditya, but it's not quite the game changer that it was 20 years ago. The thing that doesn't get discussed with radiotherapy, which needs to be discussed, particularly in the brachyboost patients, is the effect of treatment on urinary function vis-a-vis irritative symptoms. These patients have significant irritative symptoms. You know, I think that's something that you got to be upfront about. It's one of the reasons why I'm not a fan of uh, brachy boost in any patients, but certainly, you know, it's mostly indicated in high-risk patients. I just think that any additional cancer benefit you get is accompanied with some real downsides to uh, quality of life. So this is an important point. As you start to talk about radiation, you know, there are a couple of pieces you have to discuss. That's one of them. The other thing you have to discuss is hormonal therapy. Because high-risk patients should be getting, you know, two years or so of ADT as adjuvant therapy. And patients, that that is a big quality of life hit. We've seen that again and again in all the studies. And I think that's an argument to some degree towards surgery. The problem is these patients may see hormonal therapy no matter what. And so they have to be aware of that. Okay, a lot to kind of unpack there. Well, you're sitting there. There's no glaring contraindications, no extensive you know, past medical history where they're not going to be an anesthetic candidate. I mean, personally, these days, I feel like other than some kind of ultra egregious past surgical history, you know, hernia repairs, redo, redo, redo hernia repairs, multi-quadrant surgery, usually you can get in and, you know, kind of get the job done. But what are, you know, kind of relative or absolute contraindications for surgery for you? It's so funny because you you made a comment about these days, you know, this is evolving. It's actually one of the real benefits of the robot, you know, as someone who was originally a robot cynic, it's allowed us to be more aggressive in who we operate on. The real contraindication to surgery, any sort of, you know, rectal involvement, uh, whether it's a node or whether it looks like there's actually involvement of the rectum, that we're not going there. Extensive uh, bladder neck involvement, where I'm worried I'm going to end up uh, uh, finding ureteral orifice, I'm not going there either. And obviously, you can't get in the pelvis, but Beyond that is the usual surgical indications. You know, if someone has severe heart disease, can't tolerate an anesthetic. I live in Tennessee. My patients tend to be very large. I've had about once or twice a year, I have a patient who will put into Trendelenburg in the operating room asleep and will have to abort the case because their pressures just get too high and we can't aerate. So that's another thing to consider in my practice. High volume uh, nodal disease, I probably would steer the other way too to some degree. But to be perfectly honest with you, I don't want to say we'll operate on anyone these days because that is absolutely not true. But the indication for surgery is loosened. You know, we've we've loosened it up a lot. Yeah. You know, I was really fortunate at my previous institution, UT Southwestern, to have a really world-class radiology team and, and absolutely here as well. And we're bringing some of those ideas. But on the standardized MRI report, it would state, you know, tumor within two millimeters of the apex at the expected location of the urethrovesical anastomosis. And similarly, you know, tumor within two to five millimeters of the bladder neck. And there were cases when this verbiage was in there, when you went back and looked, I kind of was like, there's no way I'm going to be able to get a negative margin apically. Whether radiation's better in that context or not, who knows, but it would give me some pause. And ultimately what I ended up doing is telling the patients like, listen, I'm going to take a little bit more of the urethra the continence recovery road may be a little bit longer. We'll get you there, but it may be a little bit longer. You know, in patients that don't have a tumor at the base, I'm pretty, I I like bladder neck sparing, but if they've got, you know, bladder invasion, like you mentioned to me, that's one where if it's equivocal, I might scope them. If it's unequivocal, I'm not really interested in, you know, doing some partial cystectomy, reimplant scenario. Sounds like a lot. I mean, I have to say, 
there are patients where I'm in the operating room and I, I'm at the apex in particular, but even at the bladder neck where we didn't see it on MRI and I feel like I'm leaving cancer behind. And, and I guess I'm okay with that because, again, we've got radiation to follow and these patients are high risk enough. It's not a bad thing to say, okay, I did my surgery. I got 99% of the tumor out. Now I'm going to put in radiation and maybe we'll avoid hormonal therapy in this fellow and maybe we'll actually get, you know, a durable long-term remission. But the comment you made about the partial cystectomy, there's nothing worse than, as you know, there's nothing worse than being in an operating room and going, how far am I away from the ureteral orifice? Am I going to inadvertently put my anastomotic suture through that? Those are the patients where I look and go, maybe we're better served going in a different direction just because I don't want to hurt them with my operation. Yeah. And maybe... On the opposite end of the spectrum, we talked a little bit about contraindications, poor candidates. Are there ideal candidates in your mind? Yeah. I mean, you know, if you have someone who has, say, a pyrans 5 lesion, you know, it's high-grade disease, but it's contained in the prostate, and it's a moderately sized prostate, oh, yeah, that's a great patient for surgery because, yeah, they may be high-grade, but if it turns out to be T2, you may have cured them. And they may need no additional treatment, which is the optimal situation. And we do see those, as you know, patients who come in with discrete lesions on MRI contained in the prostate. You do your prostatectomy, you do your lymph node dissection, and you're happy to have negative margins, T2 disease, even if it's Gleason 8 disease, you still, you've got a fighting chance. Really, when I reflected on it after the great talks you gave on kind of the impact of surgery, my ideal patient has kind of evolved into somebody that's actually impotent, healthy, and has some, you know, legit cancer because I don't know how you feel about this. When I counsel patients and I kind of go through my talk, you know, I'll, I'll talk about the process of continence recovery and I'll say literally, you know, off the record in six months, you should be dry. Now for erectile function, I'll, I'll say this explicitly that I won't say the same type of statement for erectile function because there's too many variables tissue quality, preoperative function that we're really looking at, you know, maybe 20, 30% with medications. So for me, a impotent person with LUT and real cancer is kind of my ideal patient. Yeah, you're doing them a favor if they have LUTs. Uh, we know that. I have to tell you, I counsel similarly. I mean, I basically tell them, look, you're either going to be dry or maybe have a few drops and it's not going to be a problem for you. And, and the data back that statement, but it's going to take a few months to get there. For me, a big factor in counseling around sexual function, obviously baseline function. You know, I tell patients, look, this operation is not going to help you because it's not, right? But the other thing is age is an important predictor. If you're over age 65 and you come see me, I basically say, look, let's assume, even if they have great function walking in the door, let's assume that I do this operation. Even if I spare both your nerves, you're going to be impotent. Let's just put that on the table. And if you can't live with that, Let's not go to an operating room. Because I think that's a fair assumption if you look at the data, just because the reserve that the older patients have is so much less that you just don't have, you can't make that promise. I, I think I think a lot of surgeons do make that promise and they just shouldn't. Yeah, I think prepare for the worst, hope for the best is absolutely the way to go and be realistic about it. You know, so counseling, we touched a little bit about continence and sexual function. How about cancer control? Are you using nomograms? Are you ballparking? You mentioned several times now that typically you're, you're advising that this is going to be a multimodal approach. Walk me through it. Some patients, they don't want to know the numbers, to be perfectly frank with you. They just kind of walk in the door and they say, listen, I want to be as aggressive as possible or whatever you say, doc, you know, that sort of thing. I do use the nomograms and there are a bunch of great websites that you can use to quote them numbers with regard to cancer control, you know, short and long term, and will you need additional therapy? But I also tell them two things. Number one, preoperative information is not as accurate as postoperative information. Another argument, I think, for surgery up front. And I tell them that a 70% chance or a 60% chance, whatever that is, like being a little bit pregnant, right? That's for a population of patients. If it's you, it's a binary outcome. The key is for me, and you can use the nomograms, but I think it's important to say, listen, you have a high-grade tumor, you know, a high-risk tumor, whether it's high-grade, a high PSA, you have to accept the fact that you may need a second treatment. And it's hard for me to put a number on exactly what that's going to be. At the end of my kind of counseling, I typically will say myself nor nobody else can guarantee you a cure. You should be dry and you're probably going to be impotent. Those are kind of like the take-home messages. And 
I kind of agree. I was a really big ultra nomogram person early on, but those five and 10 year biochemical occurrence rate survival rates are really so dismal, to be frank. And I don't think there's anything that really translates on the radiation side. It's a little disheartening. I like line one where there's like a 99% chance you should be alive at 10 and 15 years, but that like 20 to 30% chance that you're going to be cured at five and 10 years, I just think it starts the worry wheel in like a big way while people are kind of dealing with their cancer diagnosis. You know, what I tell a lot of these patients, they'll want to know, you know, what's going to happen to me, doc? Oh, you're going to be alive at 10 years. Am I going to be cancer free? Well, maybe not. But what I've started to sort of portray is I'm turning this into a chronic disease. And if you look at the literature on metastatic disease and how it used to be just awful, metastatic disease, and, and it was a death sentence, you know, within a few years. And now more and more trials and more and more treatments, patients with metastatic disease are living five, 10 years. To me, that's, I'll tell patients, there are so many new treatments and more coming down the pike. I may not be able to make it so you never have to see me again, but I will make it so you see me a lot over the next decades, you know? And I think that's provides some comfort to patients, but you can't promise cures in these high-risk patients because, you know, it's, a, it's hit or miss. And the nomograms aren't going to help you because it's one patient, not a population of patients, right? So you never can tell. I will say in the biochemical recurrence space, to kind of diffuse the room and alleviate anxiety, I still go back to the pound paper where, you know, it's right. going to be eight years till you develop a MET and another five until you die if we do nothing. But I actually don't believe that in the kind of cancers that we're treating today. This is not grade group one, grade group two cancer, but I still conveniently use it. I don't know if you have any kind of opinion on that. I actually think you still can use it, to be perfectly frank with you, because, you know, you have to remind patients that it's just a blood test. PSA isn't what kills you, right? It's recurrent disease and metastatic disease. And yes, there are a lot of patients in the, you know, Hopkins cohort, which were low-grade Gleason 6 disease. In theory, a lot of those shouldn't have even recurred in the first place. But the fact of the matter is that I think it's a good jumping off point. Remind patients that if you do have a biochemical recurrence, it's not a death sentence. Far from it. That's more what I use it for than to say, you know, you have this amount of years till you have a biochemical recurrence because you can't do that. More interesting and important thing to stress is when you have one, it's not a death sentence. Because I think that's true even in, in the pound cohort. Yeah. And the purpose of today is really not to have a comprehensive surgery versus radiation discussion. But benefits of surgery, you mentioned PSA. You know, some people like things to be binary, black and white, PSA, either detectable, undetectable. You know, what are what are your kind of surgical benefits when you think about it honestly in your own mind? Yeah, Aditya, I got to say this sort of surgery, radiation, quote unquote, war that's gone on forever in prostate cancer is pointless. You know, in the end, both modalities are effective in controlling and treating cancer. And sometimes the combination of the two is better than either one alone. And the addition of you know, medical therapies, you know, we're, we're, we've made a lot of changes and made a lot of improvements. So when I look at surgery, what's the real benefit? Basically, number one, you're leaving yourself an additional adjuvant therapy and radiation, which is, you know, sort of a low risk intervention, uh, having adjuvant radiotherapy, whereas adjuvant surgery, as we both know, is not a low risk intervention. So that's one piece I think is very important for patients. The other thing that I think is important for patients, the argument for surgery, I should say, is you're getting more accurate diagnostic information. And I actually think there's some value to that. You could argue that there's a third benefit to surgery that you may avoid the side effects of hormonal therapy, but I don't think you can make that promise because a lot of the patients who have high-risk disease or have surgery end up seeing hormones at some point anyway. So it really just boils down to those two points. You have an additional adjuvant therapy and you have better diagnostic information. And those shouldn't be minimized, either of them, because I think both have real value. The advantage to radiation as primary therapy, as I see it, is just the avoidance of the side effects of surgery. Beyond that, any other advantage that you will get from radiotherapy, you could also get in an adjuvant setting, potentially with shorter courses and maybe lower doses. I'm not a radiation oncologist, so I shouldn't speak out of school. If you look at the PRO data from the older adjuvant radiotherapy trials, I mean, it's, it's favorable. It's not perfect, but it's very favorable. Yeah. What, what about local control? 
you think that kind of local failure free recurrence? I mean, that's a bad situation when somebody's got a nasty cancer and they recur and they're bleeding and hydro and all that misery. Do you think there's any benefit or is that kind of not real? I think you're playing to the surgeon in me now. Uh, it's a reasonable argument. And certainly uh, having trained with a lot of, you know, sort of the quote unquote giants in the field in this life, you know, Don Skinner never had a kind word to say about radiation therapy for that very reason. Okay. What about hemorrhagic cystitis? What about bilateral hydronephrosis? What about urinary retention? And there may be something to it, but the evidence isn't there to support it. At least I don't think it is. It's just what we like to think as surgeons. And one could argue radiation does provide some local control as well. So in my heart of hearts, I want to believe that, right? And certainly was trained to believe that. I wouldn't you know, bet my life on it. Let's put it that way. My understanding is we don't really have enough literature to say that interductal is radioresistant or if you have some small neuric endocrine component, but does that play into it at all for you? Not really. Again, we don't have real hard data. You know, these neuroendocrine tumors, when I see those patients, I basically tell them up front, this is going to be a hard one to fix, whether it's surgery, whether it's radiation, you're going to meet my friends in medical oncology at some point in all likelihood. It's, it's interesting because the introductal variant, they're just bad actors. And the same with cribiform, you know, like every once in a bloom when I'll see a patient getting away from high risk into sort of intermediate low risk, who is say a three plus four, but that four, the pathologist says there's a little bit of cribiform there. And to me, that's a contraindication to even talking about active surveillance. Those, those guys, they just act badly. You get unpleasant surprises with those variants. When you do surgery, you find out it's much worse than advertised. Yeah. It'll be interesting and great to see the results of the SPCG trial. Leave it up to our colleagues in Scandinavia every time to be like, you know, a light year ahead of everybody else to, to look at surgery versus surgery with adjuvant radiation versus radiation alone. And of course, there's going to be all the naysayers, you know, the staging's different, stage migration, you know, PSMA, PET scans, MRIs, blah, blah, blah. But at least there'll be a bit of data to help inform that question. It's a great study. And you're right. You got to give it to the Europeans. Don't forget the UK as well for the work they've done. It's a shame that we in the US can't sort of recapitulate what the Europeans are able to do. So, you know, actually, I think probably surgery, it's, it's fairly straightforward in this, in this scenario. You know, you've kind of alluded to it multiple times, you know, extend the lymph node dissection, use your MRI to guide nerve sparing, use your preoperative function to guide nerve sparing, preoperative pelvic floor physical therapy. But let's, let's maybe talk about when the path comes back. You've decided for surgery. First things first, are there any patients these days that you're advising for true adjuvant PSA undetectable radiotherapy? Yes but there are very few. And I actually heard someone make an argument that we should be doing more because radiation techniques have changed and the old ones may not be as applicable. But the fact of the matter is the data are the data, right? And it's clear that early salvage in a patient who is going to have good follow-up is the same as adjuvant in the majority of patients. You talk about testicular cancer. There are patients you don't do surveillance on because you know they're not going to follow up. If you know a patient's not going to follow up, maybe that's a better patient for adjuvant radiotherapy. But that's pretty rare in prostate cancer. Patients tend to be older, have Medicare insurance. The patients who I will radiate, even in the setting of a negative PSA, are patients who have clear bladder neck involvement, getting back to local control. I grossly feel like I left uh, disease behind or on path. There is a lot of disease at the bladder neck or patients who just have, you know, widely positive surgical margins. If you look at the older trials and you stratify them and look at the subgroups, those are the patients who probably are going to get the most benefit. Those are the patients I'll talk to. It's the ones who have, you know, significant positive margins, you know, high volume positive margins or bladder neck involvement. Yeah, I agree with that. And I do have a conversation with younger patients, lymph node positive, not a crazy lymph node density, maybe one out of 24 lymph nodes that want to be aggressive. And then it's literally a conversation about, do you want to do this with radiation, ADT and ABI? Are we going to like go for broke here? I was thinking patients with negative lymph nodes, positive lymph nodes, that's a whole other discussion. And you're right. I don't know what to do with those patients. Those may be patients who va who get value from from radiation, as you describe. You know this sort of triple threat with Abby and standard ADT and radiotherapy, as opposed to you know the old messing study where you just give them hormones forever and ever, amen, which is no one's idea of a good time. A lot of those patients, I'll sort of, and this is not evidence based. You know, it, talk about intermittent therapy just to sort of give them a break. I don't know what to do with PN one patients. It's a real challenging group of patients, and we're seeing more and more of them. Ironically, it's either, for me, one or the other. Either we just watch you 
and nothing adjuvant, or we bring it all radiation, ADT, Abbey. I'm sure similarly for the folks that you're worried about, multifocal positive margins, bladder neck invasion, all that, as they're kind of continuing to convalesce, that six, eight week PSA will oftentimes just kind of start giving you a signal for what's coming. I'll, and I'll typically try to have those folks get in to see the pelvic floor physical therapist pretty early. So rising PSA, persistently positive PSA. When are you sending them over to see your colleagues in radiation oncology? If someone was negative, uh, had an undetectable PSA, and now they have a detectable PSA, 0.11, 0.12, I'm sending them over at least to talk to them. You know, usually what we're doing is we're not, someone's a 0.12, we're not saying, okay, we're going to radiate you, and you were, they were undetectable before. We're not radiating right there, but what we're doing is we're following them up, you know, a month or two later to see what the PSA velocity is to see if it's real. You know, obviously, if they're sitting at 0.11, maybe you're not going to radiate them. The literature are really clear in my mind, both from the new adjuvant studies and also from some of the modeling from the older cohorts. Radiating a patient who was undetectable when their PSA is below 0.2, certainly when it's below 0.5, but maybe even when it's below 0.2, is really valuable. That's where I'm sort of going over there. The comment you made, let's say they have a persistently positive PSA after surgery, or I'm going to do adjuvant, you know, when's the right time to do the radiation? It's always been sort of a question. And I sort of subscribe to the, you know, six months or when they're dry, whichever comes first. A lot of patients will look at me and go, I don't want to wait six months, doc, if you think I need it. That's when I'll say, okay, well, there's no evidence to back me up on what I'm about to do, but let's give you a shot of a January agonist. Your PSA will be undetectable. You'll sleep better at night except for the hot flashes. The key to successful prostate cancer treatment in this age is a lot of back and forth between the surgeon and the radiation oncologist. It's not an either or. With these patients, it's going to be both a lot of the time. So the sooner we're on the same page and swimming in the same direction, the better off we are. A thousand percent. And I think that's why programs like yours and ours, you know, we really kind of embrace this multidisciplinary tumor board type of style. A, I think it helps with decision regret. B, they've met their radiation oncologist who's still a part of their care team. And it's not, you know, a whole new infrastructure, a whole new setup when that conversation takes place. I feel like, you know, that's another one of their doctors and they should have a rapport. Are you typically restaging with anything, MRI, PSMA, PET scans? Does it kind of depend on the PSA? You know, now in the post-treatment uh, biochemical recurrent space around here, there's no problem getting PSMA scans. I have had some pairs who refuse to get it if the PSA is below 0.5 based on, you know, the literature that says it's not as reliable at that setting. But I still feel like where it's probably the most helpful. But beyond that, the radiation oncologist is going to want some sort of, you know, medical legal cover, because let's say they recur in a year uh, in a distant site. One could argue that was that adjuvant radiotherapy helpful and maybe you've exposed them. So again, bone scan's a cheap test, not going to be positive in a low PSA. I, you know that, I know that. But yeah, PSMA is, it's, it just, it's a great test in that setting. Totally agree. I think, you know, there's always that kind of irony of the lower the PSA, the less likelihood you have of having a positive test, but it's never made any sense to me to wait till the PSA hits a certain threshold before you get it, because then you, know, you might have missed your window. Well, I agree with you, but you know, if you're the insurance company and you're paying for it, you're want to keep that medical loss ratio as as high as possible. Fair, fair. And in this setting, rising PSA after or persistently elevated, any genomic testing or the short answer is again. Probably not because it's not going to change my management. There are some people, and I can see the reasoning for this, getting a decipher test specifically in the postoperative setting in a patient who high risk for recurrence. And if you believe Dan Spratt, and Dan's a smart guy, I tend to believe him more often than not, that may be a, a way to stratify for adjuvant versus early salvage. But now your PSA is there. If the PSA velocity is, is going up, that's going to trump. Even if you give me a genomic test, which is, doesn't look too worrisome, I'm still going to feel better. I mean, I don't know if you, if you look at it that way. Again, I tend to be skeptical, which maybe is not a good thing, but... I don't think we're maybe there for prime time yet. I mean, the idea of 
further personalizing things with, you know, we have raves and radicals, which suggests that at a population level, early salvage is probably just as good as adjuvant. But then, of course, there's going to be some people that, you know, need some maybe an earlier intervention or maybe benefit from ADT, even at those really low PSA. So I don't think we have the data to kind of really parse out those buckets, early salvage versus adjuvant, ADT, yes, no. I feel like in the, in the upcoming years, as we start to embed tests in an, into clinical trials, we'll we'll get that data. But I I would kind of agree with you, and you know maybe if the patient is a little bit more inclined to be quote unquote aggressive, or if I'm a little bit more worried, and you know we're going to pull the trigger at 0.12, for instance, the default I think for us would generally be to not use ADT. But if their deciphered test came back as high risk, maybe we could have a conversation about six months of ADT. Mm-hmm. I don't know. What do you think? As you said, the data are evolving. You know, part of the problem is a lot of the studies that have been done have looked at sort of funny endpoints, like did it change what the doctor did or did it make the patient feel better? Those are fine endpoints, don't get me wrong, but they're very, very soft endpoints, right? Doctors, you know, what you and I do may be different and, and that's not a good or a bad thing. It's just a thing, right? So the key is looking at it in a sort of protocol, standardized manner and getting meaningful outcomes. So as the data evolves, I think we'll know more. And particularly as we get more treatments, because, you know, there may be a role for something like a checkpoint inhibitor way downstream in the selected correct patient with the right mutation and the right risk. Hopefully when I get prostate cancer, we'll be there, you know? So, And final question, ultra-sensitive PSAs. No. Yeah, I, I... Does that answer your question? A thousand percent. And that's why I'm smiling. I know this is a podcast, but to me, they just muddy the waters. They cause anxiety. I mean, if you're close at the apex or close at the bladder neck and you've got like a cell of benign prostate tissue, now everybody's freaking out and I'm not into it. Some of the studies for ultra sensitive PSA came from UCLA where I trained. So I do sort of still bleed blue and gold somewhere. But you heard my response. I mean, you're absolutely right. I have so many patients who come in, oh, my PSA is, you know, 0.07. You got to treat me now. And my response is, yeah, let's wait until we get to a reasonable level because because treating when that ultra sensitive PSA is super early versus treating when it's detectable towards a standard PSA, I'm not aware of anything that says that you're better off treating earlier on. And it drives patients insane. Yeah. Dave, I've certainly learned a wealth of information, plenty of things to kind of work into my own counseling and practice. Always appreciate your thoughtful, insightful approach to prostate cancer. Any parting thoughts for the listenership before we wrap it up? Here's the thing. I'll end where I started. High-risk prostate cancer, you got to take it seriously. I think there still is a general feeling, certainly in the lay community, but also amongst the medical community, perhaps in non-prostate cancer clinicians, that no one dies of prostate cancer. This is the strain of prostate cancer that can kill people. And so you just got to be very serious and aggressive in treating it in the majority of patients. That'd be what I'd leave you with. All right. Well, thanks again, Dave. Have a good time out there. Enjoy the uh, Titans victory over the Broncos that we just pulled out uh, from the skin of our teeth. And until next time. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, DM us at underscore Backtable on Instagram, LinkedIn, or Twitter. Backtable is hosted by Aditya Bagrodia and Jose Silva. Our audio team lead is Kieran Gannon with support from Caleb Hodson, Josh McWhorter, and Ness Smith-Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz with support from Ishan Sangwan and Vidavi Patwardhan. Social media and PR by Chi Ding. Thanks again for listening and see you next week.